Okay, so we should probably get underway. Um, this is the roundtable session, uh, the first of two roundtables that we will run tomorrow evening at 7 to 9. Uh, and so the idea of this format is that we have you know, two papers each day in the afternoon on the weekend. Uh, and then we have uh, two hours in the evening to sort of return to some of the issues that were raised, um, continue to take up questions and responses. Uh, and so the way that we'll run this is that in the first hour, um, we'll have a discussion among the participants of the roundtable. And then for the second hour, we'll open things up uh, to questions from all of you and continue to discuss in that way. Um, so for those, if anyone, uh, I think actually everyone was probably here this afternoon, which is great for the most part. Um, but two, I think, really uh, fine papers um, by Martin. Hagelin and Ray Brazier. Uh, Martin's paper, uh, A Logical Expressivist Account of, uh, sort of Fundamental Logical and I suppose Conceptual Requirements for Any Attempt to uh, Philosophize About Temporality, um, and also a critique of Bergson and Heidegger um, according to the logic of time that he spelled out in the first half of the paper. Uh, in Ray's paper, um, an engagement. Uh, both Bergson and Wilfred Sellers uh, thinking about um, different ways of um, attempting to achieve something like, I suppose, uh, an epistemologically and methodologically responsible um, philosophical realism. Uh, and uh, um, so I'm interested basically in three topics that came up um, that I think sort of linked the two papers. Um, and we don't have to take these up systematically one by one, um, but I wanted just to take note of uh, some relationships between the papers that I saw. Um, so one of them obviously is just the topic of Bergson, the uh, status of Bergson perhaps for contemporary thought, um, bearing in mind that this is a conference on vitalism and anti-vitalism. So perhaps we could return to um, not just the role of Bergson uh, in each of your papers, but maybe some relationships between the two engagements with Bergson. Uh, the second topic um, that I think really draws the two papers together uh, is time and the constitution of temporality. Um, Ray, I think you claimed at one point um, in your paper that uh, any philosophy which sort of prioritized or made central uh, the problem of time um, was threatened with kind of collapse into idealism. Um, and so I'd like to come back to uh, the problem of not only the problem of the structure of time, the possibility of thinking of time, but just the role of that problematic, of that concept in philosophy, perhaps. And then the third uh, problem, which I think really strongly linked the two papers, uh, is the question of methodology and its relation to epistemology. And so that is to say, how do we think uh, conceptuality? Um, how do we think discourse in relation to um, attempts to, uh, to think ontologically uh, a problem that came both of the papers. So I think the way that we should, we should do this is that I, I hope to sort of um, foreground some of those uh, three questions or concerns uh, linking the two papers, but I also just want to open up um, by offering all of you the opportunity to pose some questions of your own, whether they uh, relate to those specifically or not. And I thought maybe uh, it might be possible to prioritize um, Adrian and Catherine, since you didn't have uh, the opportunity to speak today, but will tomorrow. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to open with uh, the, the two speakers from this afternoon. Well, before I talk to the two speakers, I have a general question. Sure. Uh, which just appeared well, today, but before I don't know why. Uh -huh. It's about the meaning of uh, the title of this conference. Mm -hmm. To have done with life. I don't know who created that. I did. <laughs> so, well, if I understand that, if I try to translate that into French, would that mean to be done with life? Or would that mean to have done something with it and turning out towards something else? It would be like our toe to have done with the judgment of God. Now that's sort of um, to have done with to it. To have done then it means to come to an end. With to move on from or at least to um, you know, one way to think about the topic. Uh, is as a provocation. Another way to think about the topic is uh, as a question posed. 
Um, so the introduction, um, which I suppose you arrived uh, yesterday in the evening, and so we weren't able to hear the, the introduction of the conference. But I took out that question a little bit during the introduction, and uh, you know, posed the question of should we have done with life? And the problem is, uh, the general problem that I had in mind is just the difficulty of thinking coherently uh, a concept of life in the history of science and also in the history of philosophy, um, and the different problems and conceptual opori uh, that emerge when you try to do that. And so the question is, you know, if we're not able um, to think a coherent concept of life, and therefore if our sort of rhetorical uh, or conceptual use of it um, stands in for something that we don't know while well, we're pretending that we do know what we mean. Um, if we don't know what we mean by the concept of life, you know, should we either have done with it or replace it with other uh, concepts, other ways of thinking about organisms, other ways of thinking about uh, the emergence of sensation and thought, etc. Um, or should we, on the contrary, try to uh, determine exactly what the parameters of the conceptual problem are? And so those two things, I think, might potentially go together. Um, but, you know, in a provocative fashion, certainly, it was just meant to stage the, the concept of life as a problem. Um, and the subtitle, then, uh, I, I guess, returns that problem by taking it up in terms of vitalism and anti-vitalism in philosophy. And so I think that's something that was uh, dealt with quite effectively by the, by the two papers today in relation to Bergson. Is that helpful? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Very yeah. helpful. Um, I, I reread before I came, and then I started my questions to both of you. In, in, in fact, it, it is the same question, oriented differently. Um, I reread the uh, article by Camille mm -hmm. in La Connaissance et la Vie, and this article is called Mechanism and Vitalism, precisely. Um, and uh, in this text, it says that, in fact, we shouldn't consider vitalism as a form of metaphysical claim. Vitalism is in fact nothing else uh, than the affirmation, and these are the, the last lines of the text, of the creative dimension of life. So when we talk about vitalism, we mean that life is nothing else but a creative process. And this is also what is implied in Bergson's, of course, title, L'évolution uh, créative. And um, I think that this creation, if we understand life as a creative process, we have to understand it both as a biological, biologically creative process, evolution itself, and, and Bergson, of course, means uh, that when, with his title, but also artistic and poetic, and I also think of your talk, uh, process. And I think this is the common point also between Bergson and Nietzsche. That life is nothing conceptual, that life is a name of a pure movement, in fact. That it is not a concept, it is not something metaphysical. That's why I was also asking about the conceptual con content of that title. Because after, after all, and this is my, my question to Ray to start with, after all, perhaps when we talk about life, there's no way in which we have to separate concept and experience, or concept and uh, the manifest, as you said, perhaps, and to me, it is what Bergson tried to, to show. Life is nothing but, in a way, a work of art, a biological, a biological one, and uh, a scientific one. So, in that sense, uh, when you say that in Bergson there is no experience of duration, but only a concept which is superimposed uh, when you talked about the passage from S to S dash, etc. I found you a little unfair because this experience is precisely the creation itself. And it is as if you didn't at all deal with Bergson's style. For him, writing is not an ornament or a rhetorical process, it is the experience of life as this passage as duration. There is, a, I think for me, some, in, in some very, it is, Bergson, sorry, is one of the rare occurrence of a philosophical writing, a writing which is, in a way, creative of his own object. So my question is, what about Bergson's style? What about this art, artistic practice 
which answers in a way your question, which is the in between the concept and the manifest or the intensity of the quality of the outfit. It seems to me that you presented uh, an aspect of Bergson that Bergson himself wouldn't have accepted at all. You transform him into a uh, metaphysician, like dealing with uh, sellers and, and trying to answer questions, which I think, he, well, this is precisely what he hated <laughs> under the name of intelligence. He said, I'm not intelligent, I'm an artist in a way. So, so what about that? What, what about this? Um, well, I, life as a practice, life as, and this is also what you just said. And I have the same question for you. I mean, it, it seems to me that when Heidegger criticizes Bergson, for example, and we can deduce the same thing with Derrida, I think that he would say exactly the same thing against him. There's a kind of injustice to the extent that for them, you know, the trace or time is a process without any creative dimension. Uh, there's this iterability of the trace in Derrida, and uh, temporalization and spatialization in latifibons are these repetitive processes. And it seems to me that in Heidegger, he criticizes Bergson very much because of the uh, supposed metaphysical attachment, this concept of time, the metaphysical content, content of this concept of time. But at the same time, what they both obliterate, both Heidegger and Derrida, again, is this artistic dimension which is totally absent from Zeinud's sight uh, and from ontology, according to me. So, this is my question. What about life as an artistic process? Not as a concept, not as a really an experience, but as a movement of creation, very simply. Do you want to uh, Yes. Um, you're not going to make my response. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, first of all, I think the term, cre I mean, I think this is one of the big, big problems about this kind of, about Bergson as a figure. And um, I think that the claim that life, um, Bergson explicitly says that it's artists who provide this paradigm of, when he talks about it again, the purification of, perfect, of perception that he thinks is required to kind of, uh, uh, you know, a kind of a, that would enable meta metaphysical insights. You think that artists are exemplary, are exemplary because they provide you an example of uh, uh, purification of perception. They allow us to see and feel things that we haven't, that our, our kind of perceptual habits can prevent us from seeing and feeling. Um, and he, the examples he gives are like um, various painters. I think the term creation is, apt, the, the claim that life is creation is completely empty. And kind of, uh, you can see life is destruction, banality, ubiquity. In other words, the, 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 the creativity of life um, is so kind of ubiquitous. Um, there's no difference between a work of art and a snowflake or a grain of sand. In other words, you empty the word creation of any normative content. If, once you've generalized and ontologized creation and novelty to that extent, you're, you're actually refusing to think novelty. Because so you remember evolution, everything. right? Yes. Let's say evolution. So, 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 so the word, in fact, Bergson is incapable of thinking of creation or novelty. Nothing is new. Precisely because it's always the same kind of. There's no difference between a work of art and a snowflake and an avalanche and a monsoon that kills 5,000 people. It's the same thing. So the, the, valorization, so the, the valorization of creativity is a completely <laughs> logical operation. And this is one of the most pernicious things about this contemporary kind of rhetoric of vitalism. The, words, for, the word creation is meaningless in this Bergsonian register. It really is papering over an absence of thought, a failure of thought. So I think that Bergson is incapable of thinking art. He's incapable of thinking invention and novelty and innovation. That's a big problem. Um, I'm sorry, I have another example. Okay. Uh, as far as aging, um, aging, aging. once again, Bergson, he doesn't, he points to experience, he doesn't actually give you any kind of, the word experience is also a word of creation. It's a word that is brandished as a kind of, a, as a symbol of sorry. It's meaningless. What is experience? Bergson doesn't tell us what experience is. Kant tells us what experience is. 
Hegel tells us about experiences. Philosophers like vital, you know, the problem of vitalism is that it brandishes a signifier experience as a way to kind of uh, to browbeat anyone who demands a kind of uh, that this term is, you know, explaining the obscure by the more obscure. We don't know what we mean when we talk about experience, and I think it's important to be very clear about what we mean by experience, so that we don't fetishize experience in this way, which leads to, frankly dubious consequences. I'm in favor of intellection against instinct. And I think one of the, you know, Ben's paper yesterday pointed out that the vitalism is a kind of, as, there's two questions about vitalism. One is its contemporary resurgence as an ideology in contemporary kind of late capitalist culture. And it's clear that it's a signifier that is in the service of, you know, really kind of problematic, um, you know, a really problematic kind of, uh, late capitalist ideology. Um, and the second question is the issue of its kind of internal kind of conceptual consistency. I think Bergson, to his credit, is an extraordinary philosopher because of his conceptual ingenuity, but he never talks about experience. My claim is that when you point to kind of Bergson's, you know, tell me what Bergson says about experience, other than saying that the passage of the present into the past is something that cannot be uh, conceptually circumscribed or cannot be determined in terms of any determinate qualities. I don't think Bergson talks about experience at all. He makes you think he's talking about experience, and that is his, his, his extraordinary skill as a writer. Okay? So I think he is an extraordinary, you know, extraordinary stylist. But I find his style frustrating because the whole point in Bergson is Bergson's continuously using the resources of conceptualization, of conceptual precision, and imagery and metaphor to point to things that are allegedly unconceptualizable, unspatializable, etc., etc. He's a great seducer, um, but he's also a great corrupter. Yeah, and I think it's important to kind of, you know, take a stand. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I, well, why do you think I'm being unfair to Burks? What do you think in Bergson? What is it you're defending in Bergson? Well, your argument. Uh, well, when you said uh, that um, this style is just seduction, whatever, it is the kind of like platonic argument which I thought we were. Well, I thought that deconstruction. Um, uh, so, uh, put that away, definitely. I mean, you can't, by no means, consider a style as a kind of clothing which is hiding the conceptual lack. It doesn't hide anything. It's, it's, a, I'm not a, it's an extremely polished But I think that Bergson's <coughs> texts, whatever we think about them, are undoubtedly. Uh, something which in itself is an experience, this is what I mean. I mean, it doesn't write, uh, I'm writing like I'm using beautiful arguments to hide my incapacity uh, to argue about experience. I think, and I think this is how the looks interprets for example. So, I mean, the way in which he writes is, according to me, the very proof, the very, the very, uh, Hmm. What he means by experience, something perhaps, and you're right, which cannot be defined. But um, <coughs> I, I don't understand when you say that creativity is an empty word. This, I, you know, I think Russell. I mean, I think Russell's unfair to Bergson, but like Russell's great line against Bergson, Bergson Bergsonians have never forgiven him to this day. He says, like, you know, the stance. That, you know, uh, Bergson invites us to adopt the stance of a little puppy with its mouth open, waiting for a sweetie to be dropped into its mouth. So that's the attitude. The idea that the future is going to be kind of the promise of novelty, it's the promise of this, there's nothing, the, the valorization of the future, the claim that whatever is coming next is good because it's new. That's just a completely empty Bergson claim. Never, never said that. Then why is he valorizing? What does creation mean? Why is novelty good then? 
this is a philosophical thing. What does it mean to say that novelty is like creep? We, we can understand that artistic invention is good precisely because it has a normative valence. Inventing or discovering something in a conceptual register is and ought to be valorized, but simply saying that kind of the new novelty as such is good. I mean, I just find that claim kind of, literally kind of, uh, and it's, it's constantly reiterated, and I just think it's kind of ideology. It's just like, just be grateful that something, you know, something is going to happen. It doesn't matter what. Why? Why be grateful that you have a few, that something is going to happen? Don't you care about what it is that happens, the conditions under which it happens, what it enables to happen, etc., etc.? So I, do, I, I, I think this, and I'm surprised to see you defending Bergson this way, because I think you know, there's lots of, you know, I, I admire Bergson, I think he's a brilliant stylist, he, he's, he's a brilliant philosopher, but precisely because he stops people from asking these questions, why, what is it we're affirming when we affirm novelty? Does all novelty deserve to be affirmed? These are important questions. Mark Nowander, if you'd like to. Yeah, yeah. I'd so, <laughs> uh, like to follow up um, and uh, in response to what you were saying, because the critique I was leveling at Bergson is not an external critique. It's one that takes seriously his own account of duration, trying to show that he cannot think the passage of time. Uh, so the, 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 um, um, how his own account of duration is incoherent because he refuses to think negativity. So, on the one hand, Bergson wants to think like the complete qualitatively distinctness of any given state, as, as well as the, the, the difference between S and S dash. And that would mean that each great state was completely discrete. That's the only way you could have a sign of a singular, that it's like completely discrete in itself. At the same time, Bergson understands that if you have something discrete, you don't have any passage of time, because the passage of time precisely entails that this discrete passes away as soon as it comes to be. So there is nothing discrete. Uh, so that raises the problem of the synthesis of this passage of time, uh, which is very good to raise in relation, for example, to like, if I am my experience, and my experience is passing away, that means that I'm passing away, so how does it subsist over time? Now, Bergson tries to solve this problem of synthesis through a notion of pure continuity, the pure continuity of duration. But when he does that, he again loses any coherent thinking of the passage of time. Because then, he says, like, well, there is actually just one state that continues. You know? So you, uh, you have something that is completely general and doesn't make a very differentiation because it's pure continuity. So I was trying to show how uh, the structure of the trace allows you to think the passage of time because it negates anything discrete by thinking the constitutive negativity of the moment, but then it doesn't anchor the synthesis in the continuity that again fails to think that negativity, but it grabs the continuity in the material support of a trace that itself is destructible, itself is temporal, and so on. So, and that's precisely then to undermine uh, the cons that the Bergson's idea that you can think time on the basis of movement. So when you say that life is the name of a pure movement, it's precisely that conception of a pure mo movement, which is really a pure dynamic, that I'm trying to show is incompatible with the rigorous thinking of time. That, um, so, and that's not, and I don't think one can rebut that by, by, by invoking a notion of creativity so, and one has to give an account of this philosophical problem because Bergson is racing. What's interesting with Bergson, what makes it productive for me to think with Bergson, is that he's very, very earnestly posing the problem of time. And he sees that you can't have a discrete instance. He tries to think this, and he, and he realizes that, or that the history of philosophy has failed to think this problem. And, and, but, but precisely by going for the solution of continuity, he shows the internal aquarius and contradictions of that. And then you can read against himself, actually, the necessity of the trace structure through the very contradictions that his account produces. And that's valuable. But to reach that value, we have to take him seriously as, as a conceptual thinker who's trying to grasp the philosophical problem and meet him on that ground and produce a counter-account, rather than, like, uh, invoke this uh, creativity that... Uh, I don't see what that, what that provides in terms of a contribution 
to the philosophical thinking of the problem of time. Uh, like I, I, I don't see like how would this notion of creativity solve the problem of the synthesis of succession, for example. Like I see it as a way of circumventing uh, the problem. And in relation to what, what was raised about the, the, the problem of the new and so on, one of the models of the trace is also like one of the effects of, of pure continuity is also that Bergson can't think the new for, for yet another reason that, that Ray didn't mention, because he assumes that time is complete continuity. And if it is continuity, he has to assume that what comes doesn't break the continuity. So we can't think radical novelty, because radical novelty involves the possibility of discontinuity. So he's already, pre he's already anticipated the movement of time into the future as continuous, and thereby also, whereas the track of the trace, precisely by thinking constituted negativity, at every juncture opens the possibility of discontinuity and so on. And that we can go. And I agree that we can, that we shouldn't valorize that as a novelty because it is both the chance and the threat, both the condition of possibility of the positive and the negative. So like that's what's powerful for me about the structure of the trace. It allows you uh, to think that that very exposure to destruction is inseparable from the possibility of transformation and creation and so on. But that transformation and creation is always going to be inhabited by this negativity that prevents it from being reified into like a positive concept like creation or something like that. So that's so so I want to take Bergson very I don't want to reduce him to a stylist or, or a nice writer. I want to say that like he what is valuable with his work is that throughout he was really trying to grapple with the incredible difficulty of thinking the problem of time. The fact that the solution is inadequate still makes it still makes it still valuable and I can learn a lot from the way he traverses the problem and all the problems he runs into. And the challenge in responding to that is to produce an account uh, that is more, cons more consistent, more responsive to the philosophical exigencies in thinking something like the concept of time. So, um, before, oh, do you have a remark to contribute to that? Well, since we were asked to start with questions about Bergson, uh, and I have uh, you know, one small contribution to that, uh, although I don't have any real investment in Bergson, so I'm happy for us to move on. Well, I wonder, if, I wonder if I could just add something really quickly in relation to the, what Catherine said, and, that, and then we'll turn to you and, and some of your questions, because uh, I wanted to try to um, respond to the question about the conference title again, to clarify exactly an example of what I mean and think about the conceptual aporia you know, uh, created by the concept of life in a figure like Bergson. Um, and in order to specifically uh, make clear the way in which I think that Bergson's conception of life certainly is metaphysical, and that we can isolate quite precisely uh, an example of how uh, the metaphysical logic of his argument operates. So for example, just to take a passage, and of course it's always dangerous to you know, isolate a passage in a philosophical text, but to take a passage which I think is quite representative of the, of the program you know, in um, creative evolution, I mean, Bergson says that life inserts some indeterminacy into inanimate matter. Life inserts indeterminacy into inanimate matter. And so if we think about that in relation to Darwinism, that proposition, uh, which for me characterizes you know, the way that life is thought in that book, um, what does it mean? It means if there isn't uh, uh, indeterminacy in inorganic matter, then how does life emerge from it? in the first place. So if we need life in order to insert indeterminacy into inorganic matter, then where does life come from as something which, is emer which emerges from inorganic matter? Now that's one level of a conceptual aporia which I take to be inconsistent with Darwinism. And the way that one might solve that conceptual aporia is then to hypostasize life as a metaphysical concept which basically uh, sweeps through inorganic matter, let's say, and, like, you know, ontologically is a principle of vitality and creativity. Now, and then you have a properly metaphysical vitalism. So either you have an argument which is sort of incoherent from a materialist perspective, that is to say, insofar as life inserts something into inorganic matter, it is not physical. It's metaphysical, because physical matter is not endowed with indeterminacy through life and it needs to be inserted into it. And so you can precisely isolate the way in which the logic of that argument is metaphysical and the reason why it becomes a properly vitalistic ontology. Um, so that's an example of what I mean uh, by the conceptual aporia, 
that the concept of life generates, and then the way in which it tries to cover over those conceptual aporia through a metaphysical hypostatization. Yeah. And I think that speaks to my point that like, what is a philosophical value in Bergson is that he's willing, in a way, to expose those aporia because he goes all the way in the number of propositions. So like, in that way, he's not just a seducer. If you don't allow yourself to be seduced by the solution, what, what he thinks is actually a self-evident claim turns out to conceal a number of really important aporias to reflect upon, whether that's in the register of the constitution of time or the relation between life and matter and so on. I mean, that's always like, um, so um, precisely because he's so speculative and, and takes on such grand metaphysical questions in seemingly uh, without much of the methodological worries that other philosophers had since Kant, you know, he just sort of does metaphysics in a way. Uh, person of, and, and by doing that, like he also exposes these conceptual problems. So. Should we turn to the, sorry, go ahead. Oh, the last thing. It's not, well, according to me, it's not so much about novelty. Life is not, creation is not so much about novelty. Rather than um, duration of movement, how to keep something in movement, purely and simply until the end. And this is what, it, what it's trying to think. It's not novelty per okay. se, because it doesn't care. Yeah. It is, how is that that we... Uh, and how is that? Uh, I mean, how does it feel? It's very close to the collapse. Yeah. Right. Something which lasts until the end. And it's not possible without this movement, without duration. But that's my question. How does something endure? How does something endure? If it's like that's 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 what you have to give an account of. I agree with you that this is, and that's the right question to ask. Like, yeah. how does something and end? Or, never does. Oh, uh, he does in the in the passages that I, I was quoting there. And anyway, I thought that Heidegger does the same move at first. And anyway, he also doesn't give an account of the problem. But that's what one has to do. And the question is just like, do you think it's viable to have an account of duration, where duration just sustains itself by virtue of its own power? Yeah. That that's a dynamic conception. So do you do you, so if that's what creativity has to do with the yes. capacity to sustain duration, then you're also committing yourself to a notion uh, of something purely dynamic, something that doesn't have to rely on any external material or spatial support, in short, it doesn't have to rely on any trace structure of time, to sustain itself. It's just by virtue of its own dynamism that it lasts until the end. That's it has to do with nature. Well, so I mean, this is a very nature, in you know, it's not the self-subjective no, no, I know, I know, but it doesn't matter if you call it consciousness or life or, or whatever you call it, as long as you have a conception of that, like, what allows something to endure across time, to, to have duration, is something that is purely dynamic. And I would say that that's the, that's, that's the metaphysical conception of presence. I mean, presence is not, the metaphysical conception of presence is not this, like, punctual instant. It's precisely the idea of something that is present in itself as a dynamic movement. So it just surprises me that, that you would want because to commit to, to, to well, such a notion of duration. Because, uh, frankly, uh, I don't care about metaphysics of presence anymore. You know, our presence is deconstructed, so let's talk about presence. Oh yeah, that's what, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to talk about constitutional presence. How can something be present across time? I'm trying to give an account of that. I think the trace when you develop it the way I want to develop, it gives an account of that. But I don't see how you can give an account of that, that has recourse to a pure dynamic, uh, except by committing yourself to, to uh, a metaphysical notion of something that is in itself. Uh, so, so that's just what I'm... Uh, yeah. Well, let's move to Adrian's yeah. questions. Well, one last Bergson yeah. uh, point, and, and perhaps then we can also tackle some of the other issues on the agenda that sure. uh, you can play out later. Um, and uh, in listening to Ray's uh, rendition of Bergson in particular, uh, something came to mind that I want to run up the flagpole and see if one or both of you salutes in response to this or not. Uh, now, uh, uh, and also, pardon me invoking Hegel again, this has been my recent obsession and often, of course, uh, you know, the hangover of, of material we've been playing with uh, most recently stays with us for a while, so uh, I'm a bit obsessed uh, at present with, uh, uh, with this particular figure. Um, but it occurred to me that there is a point Hegel makes uh, already in the Yana period prior to the phenomenology 
that I think can be uh, appropriated and used to problematize Bergson in a way that I'm wondering if either of you are sympathetic towards. Uh, now, uh, in his uh, text, Who Thinks Abstractly, this rather short essay, uh, the gist of what Hegel puts forward in there uh, could be uh, uh, captured by uh, claiming that the notion of the concrete apart from the abstract is itself the height of abstraction. Uh, and it seems to me that one can modify that thesis uh, with respect to Bergson can really apply it by saying that in the same way the notion of the, uh, of the temporal apart from the spatial, uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, the intensive uh, magnitude of duration apart from the extension of the spatial, that the notion of the temporal apart from the spatial is itself the height of the spatial. Right, uh, and of course, uh, the one of the words you used several times, Ray, in, in, in talking about Bergson was analysis. Right, the idea of taking experience and decomposing it, breaking it apart into these constituents, so that even if you don't have, uh, you know, ontological dualism in terms of uh, substance metaphysics, you certainly get a property dualism uh, with this fundamental distinction between uh, the spatial and the essential. And it seems to me that there is a basic self-defeating quality to bear on this position uh, that causes it to implode in the same way that if we now turn to the phenomenology as the culmination of the game period. You know, in the same way that the aspects of space and time appealed to by the figure shape of consciousness that is late in sense certainty uh, falls in upon itself. And so it seems as though from both a Hegelian and then a Solarsian post-Hegelian position, one would have to say ultimately that Bergson is a uh, representative right, uh, would I think be vulnerable to the same kind of self-defeating uh, sort of position in terms of this basic fundamental distinction that is so crucial for his entire apparatus and that of course is inherited by French post-structuralists like Kristeva starting revolution in poetic language, etc. So I'm just interested in terms of how the two of you feel about you know, that kind of basic, well, here's why I can spare myself the labor of going back to their song after this conference and having to reread him in addition to everything else. Um, yeah, that's, that's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, that sounds, uh, I mean, yeah, no, that, that sounds, I do think that, um, well, I, you know, one of the interesting issues, I think, in, uh, in Bergson is and in, in fact, it's taken up again in, in Deleuze, in Deleuze's kind of uh, critique, the kind of objections to kind of what he takes to be um, dialectic in different traditions, when he says that you can never concepts al along the dialectic and the you know, dialectical um, relations, you know, relations between concepts will never uh, engender a real movement. They'll only kind of, uh, it's the illusion of movement, the, the illusion of differentiation of dynamism, masquerading as the thing itself. And Bergson insists in introductions of metaphysics over and over again that you can never go from concepts to the real. You can never reconstruct uh, the dynamism and the integral nature of, of, of real dynamisms from purely kind of uh, conceptual constructions. Um, but the problem is, and that's, so I, th I think the problem about articulating the relationship between kind of concepts and objects or concepts and non or extra conceptual reality is a uh, remains an outstanding problem. And I think that one of the again one of my I want to be kind of I don't want to sound as if I'm I'm, I'm not at all dismissing Bergson. Um, I hope that's clear. I'm not dismissing him out of hand. Um, but one of the the problematic is that he hasn't. Taking it kind of by dismissing the dialectic and, the, the, and more specifically the relationship between the dialectical logic that governs relations between concepts and whatever non-dialectical structures uh, might be invoked uh, as governing the relationships between you know, uh, objects, um, articulating that relationship is an outstanding philosophical problem, and I, and I think he's too quick. He's too quick. To, kind of to fasten on to duration and the experience of duration as saying, here we have the real. Here we just immerse ourselves in the thing itself. We're there. We're already able. He says, unlike Hegel, Hegel says, you know, we're already there. The absolute is close. It's not, you know, transcendent. It's nearby, but we have to work very hard. We have to go through this laborious conceptual and historical process to, to finally kind of realize it, to achieve it. It, it. it involves a kind of a labor. And in a way, 
you know, Bergson's claim initially is like, no, we're here, we're already kind of we can, you know, the absolute is here. It's not kind of the Well, actually, that is Hegel's position, right? I mean, Hegel's uh, development of the notion of the absolute in relation to Spinoza's reconception of God on the basis of appreciating the proper status of infinity as including the finite within it, rather than in a Verstappen style uh, binary distinction, there being just an externality of infinity and finitude with respect to each other. You know, for Hegel, you know, to think subject to substance is to think thinking itself as just an inner folder inflection of the absolute. So there is that similarity with Bergson. But yes. it's a realism of the concept is the flip side of his idealism of the object that makes for the difference in Hegel. So the idea of anything that's fundamentally ineffable, unknowable, other with a capital O, a kind of impenetrable alterity is out of play. Now that doesn't mean a mega mind in a subjective sense devours all of reality de facto, right? Um, but there it's for him to say that you know the idea that concepts can get a purchase on things is to think of concepts in merely a subjective idealist sense. Mm -hmm. This is realism of the concept. And that, of course, I think is an underlying condition of possibility for what you described as this mobile line between the noumenal and the phenomenal, where the noumenal isn't really noumenal anymore in the sense of, uh, in essence and principle, absolutely inaccessible, right? What makes uh, you know, the noumenal, in your sense, open to indefinite incursions is precisely the fact that there is not a fundamental alienness of objects with respect to what is recapitulated on the side of subjectivity and its thinking in terms of concepts, uh, at least. But so I think for me, that's where I would see one of the big differences between the other table and their song. So, did you want to speak to no, no, go, go. Okay, so, so I'll just uh, be very quick, I think. So, the basic logical structure of Hegel's argument with about these matters, I mean, I think in its formal structure it's very powerful, right? Because it, it, it proceeds from saying that, like, what you show dialectically is the co implication of apparent opposites. And what that means is that as soon as someone tries to take one pole of this opposite and make it absolute, it's going to turn into its other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, that is an extremely powerful form of logical structure, which I think, I mean, is like part of the sort of just awe-inspiring and genius of the way Hegel demonstrates this in so many cases. Now, so I'm very sympathetic to that. Now, what I'm trying to do in the reading of Bergson is to give that much more specificity in relation to his own account. So here, specifically concerns time and space. So I don't want to, this again, I don't want to make it do an external critique of Bergson. You know, uh, so I want to, so instead of uh, say, uh, saying that, from an external perspective, saying like, well, you can't have time without space, or you can't have intuition without intellectual. No, I want to say like, let's go and look at what you say about your time, yeah. uh, and I'll show you <laughs> that when you try to make it absolute, it's going to turn into an absolute coexistence, as he says, which yeah. is a spatial attitude. And I make that demonstration, but I want to make it like integral to his own account, to precisely show that the only way to think what he's trying to think is to think the logic of the trace. And then, on the basis of that logic, take apart his oppositions that on, on the higher order level. So that's a very imminent operation that, like, on an abstract sort of level, I think it, it's very compatible with that formal logical scheme you get from Hegel. But again, as Hegel himself knew, philosophy is not about the result. It's about how you get there. Anyone can agree on the result of something. I mean, it, it's about how you actually arrive at a conclusion. So it's that path, that method, that is what is philosophical. Uh, uh, and, and so I don't want to satisfy myself with that. I can find a lot of people who agree with me that like, oh, Bergson's conclusions are untenable. I want to give a philosophical account of why they are untenable and how those same problems should be fought, because there are, there are real problems. And Bergson allows you to think about them because he thinks seriously about them. That's how I take him seriously as a philosopher, even though I widely disagree with his conclusions. Well, in that sense, you know, it's uh, you know, you, you uh, I think you know, exemplify one of the lessons of the phenomenon of the world is that the only critiques worth making are imminent ones. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, And there's no point in just headbutting in terms of external critique. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, just to follow on from this, so I think look, the critique of the negative in Bergson is also this other the critique of dialectics, the critique of the negative. Again, it's you know, like so Dirk is a straight from Bergson. Now, I think this is problematic. This is. This is where you have to think carefully about the limits of imminent critique. Because, um, in other words, one of the problems of dealing with a philosopher who, for instance, doesn't realize, who, who doesn't want, who's not beholden to contradiction. Every time you kind of, you know, if you don't believe in kind of, you know, that concepts are governed by kind of relations of opposition and contradiction, 
then any time someone tries to kind of point out an inconsistency, you can say, well, it's not an inconsistency. It's yeah. not an, you can simply maneuver your way out. And this, this is what, you have to be careful here. So you have to kind of negotiate. And, and I think actually this is a, something else. That I think the, the critique of, again, as, as brilliant and ingenious as it is, one of the enabling conditions, I think, of philosophy, and one of the things that distinguishes philosophy from sophistry in Plato, um, and I think it really has to be taken very seriously, is um, the idea that you must affirm the powers of the negative, the powers of negativity, because there's a link between thinking and negating. And in, the, in a dialogue like the sophist, uh, when you know, kind of uh, Parmenides and um, Theotetus are debating about kind of how you define the sophist. Part of the problem, which leads on to, to challenging the Parmenidean um, kind of prohibition on kind of thinking the being of non-being, uh, the claim, one of the claims is that, well, the sophist is he who denies that he denies. <laughs> he's, he's engaged in a kind of performance of contradiction. In other words, there's no way to make things, I think, this, a version of this argument can be extended to a version. Anyone who denies negativity, who ends up like, you can't, in other words, there's a kind of, the resources of the logic of conceptualizing, this is why I think, and this is very interesting in Bergson, that he does offer a positive account, a non-dialectical account of concept formation. Um, and Deleuze tries to develop it in its full-blooded sense. Um, but the claim is, how do you kind of, um, debates or negotiate about conceptual obligations with someone from the because the logic is because concepts are not governed by logic. There's no logic of the concept in that, or, or if there is a logic of the concept, it's one that is not governed by um, the familiar kinds of uh, you know prohibitions on kind of contradiction, etc., etc. That's very quick to follow up with because that's, that's what I'm trying to answer in a way. I mean, um, by the way, like Henry Stanton once said this very memorable thing that like the lowest critique of negativity is not a step beyond Hegel, but just a retrogression to a quasi Augustinian metaphysics. That is, it, 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 just as Augustine says, like evil has no being, only the good has being. Like the lowest says, the, being, the, the negative has no being. It's just pure positivity. So it's like, so it's not, so it doesn't actually like reckon with the dialectical critique. It just steps back from it. Uh, but that's a parenthesis. Now, so one could critique that externally, and, and, and then the race seems to think that one can only do it externally, but I, the way you can do it internally, I claim, is that because both Bergson and Deleuze commits themselves to a notion of becoming, and hence the temporality, and you can show in terms of their own account that their own account of becoming inverts into being as soon as they deny negativity by virtue of their own reasoning. So, so that's how I would claim that I can do an internal critique of them as well. Because as soon as, as, soon as they evacuate negativity from their conception of becoming, becoming becomes about another version of being. So they fail to think what they actually claim to think. And that's how I would do an internal critique. So in that way, I think it is possible to do that. And, and that's how I would proceed. I was trying to outline one version of that in the paper today, and, and I would do it more like extensively in, in the lower piece. I, I agree with you, and I, and I think in that sense, you know, an internal critique is possible, but then, you know, the rejoinders are telling is like when um, you, you can say, when you point out, you know, an inconsistency or a contradiction between, you know, the kind of limited conceptual logic, you know, between the kind of the, the positions you're espousing and the actual contents of the, uh, the concepts that are deployed to defend them, um, someone can just say, well, that's based on, they don't have to respond. They can just ignore you and say, you're a bad person, well, this would be called the case of not being, you know, yeah. technically being insulted. Yeah, or, or, or they can, but, and it's frustrating. Like it, that's what Aristotle calls on vegetables in, uh, in, in the metaphysics, that they want to deny a pencil of contradiction. They can't say anything. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I'm, I'm, but there's a real problem about um, those who kind of, who substitute kind of, you know, kind of, uh, whether it's kind of invent. A, a kind of a, a pathos of affirmation, of intensification, of liberation, of creativity for the kind of the constraints of justification. Because then you end up pathologizing, you know, in, in the kind of it, it's crassest Nietzschean form, it's like you pathologize 
justification is a kind of uh, reactive, reactive, blah blah blah. Yeah. And meanwhile, um, and you just ignore, you just ignore, you know, your, your critic. And the, the problem is, is that someone who simply kind of um, they can just look away. They can negate you by looking away and not listening. To and not so far as they won't have philosophical purchase. Right. They have to speak, and as soon as they speak, they're in the game. But no, because they're not. Ber Ber How is Bergson going to respond? He said, "Well, I'm not speaking. I'm just like I'm not using. You're mistaking my discourse. In other words, you're, you're the symbolic transcription of my of the real process that I'm describing for the kind of the, 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 the idea that the philosophical discourse can be sort of rhetorically and royal." Sort of, uh, <coughs> intuitively immaculate in that sense. Uh, but you're only dealing with the rhetorically and royal version. But, but I wonder if we could move yeah. to, the, uh, to the next topic. And I think the way that we could do this is that um, uh, because it concerns a specific relation uh, and perhaps a, one that you might uh, want to argue a bit over, perhaps, um, we could begin this time with uh, Martin and Ray, and then perhaps out of that conversation, uh, Catherine and Adrian might have questions to, to follow up. Um, so Ray, I mean, I wonder um, if we could actually return to that remark that you made quite briefly in your, in your paper, if you're willing to, um, about, uh, you know, the problem of philosophies of time, if we in fact view this problem, um, uh, tending toward idealism. And perhaps that might, you know, be a a place to begin a sort of conversation, not only about a specific concept of time, but the place of, you know, the thinking of time and philosophy. Um, okay, well, I want to qualify, again, I don't want to be misunderstood. I think the problem, as I see it in Bergson, is that um, the experience of duration becomes a kind of, uh, you know, becomes embroiled in, in the kind of the, the account of, what, of of the nature of time, the nature of kind of of temporality, um, and it turns out because it is inherently subjective, because time duration is subjective, is considerably subjective. It turns out that subjectivity is, you know, um, fundamentally kind of uh, implicated in the fabric of, of reality. It's a, it's a it's a constituting condition of reality, um, and this is a, but it's not. And again, the word idealism here. So in that sense, this would be a kind of so. This would be metaphysical idealism because it, it makes subjective experience into a constitutive and ineliminable component of reality. That's one kind of you know, metaphysical idealism. Um, however, you don't. Um, now, this is not to say that kind of, you know, Martin and I were, were talking about this. In other words, this is not to say that an attempt to kind of to identify, um, to attribute a kind of a fundamental or kind of constitutive status to the logic of temporal, the logic of the trace of temporality, insofar as it governs all other kind of, uh, other conceptual economies, is not, that, you know, that is not necessarily idealist by itself. And also the word idealism, it's one of these, it means so many different things in different contexts, and I don't think it's useful to kind of simply kind of, um, you know, as I say, like, Sellers is an idealist, and that's also why he's a realist, and his idealism and his realism are intimately connected, and that, so I think th these terms must be strategically deployed. Saying idealism bad, realism good, or, you know, materialism good, idealism bad, those are, I mean, those, those kind of, those are not satisfactory or helpful because the two terms, they can only ever, ever be strategically deployed. And if you think that there's more, and because they're reciprocally presupposing, they're always kind of, you know, and you, you can't ever have a kind of a position that will kind of, uh, that could be kind of definitively, um, that could repudiate what the one or the other. Kind of. Can I ask just a very quick uh, uh, question for the sake of clarification? Uh, now, when you were talking about sellers in precisely this fashion, as both an idealist and a realist, uh, you did speak of uh, a difference between what you call conceptual idealism on the one hand and sort of scientific realism on the other. Um, and all uh, I want to know at this point is how you see uh, the relations or distinctions between what you're calling conceptual idealism on the one hand and then on the other hand, uh, Subjective idealism as well as absolute idealism. I 
so you have these three different species of, or perhaps only two, but uh, three labels for idealism. Uh, and I'm wondering how you think of them in, in, with respect to each other. Well, very simply, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm sure kind of, my account's going to be unsatisfactory, but you know, so the prototypical subjective idealist would be someone like Barclay, who thinks that because ideas can only exist in minds, you know, individual mind and individual minds and that's kind of um, circumscribed and kind of contained in the mind of God. So the idea is that, is that mind, you know, minds are the ultimate kind of reality. Everything that exists is an idea in someone or something's mind. So, so that would be kind of subjective idealism. Objective idealism is the claim that ideas have an independent existence. They're not mind dependent. The ideas, this is, I guess this is a kind of a fairly, a kind of a vulgar kind of interpretation of Plato. Um, objective idealism is a claim that ideas are not mind dependent, um, but minds come into contact with ideas. And no, you know, physical or empirical phenomena through their kind of transaction with ideas. Um, their absolute idealism um, is, as far as I know, Hegel's the only kind of proponent of that. I mean, that's, I mean, the absolute idealism is a claim that kind of the ideal and the, you know, the becoming, you know, the becoming substance of subject, kind of the point at which um, the real and the ideal kind of fuse and interpenetrate in a way I think that that Sellers defend a version of this thesis, but he defends it in a very kind of modest, in, in, in a way, in a, actually, in a way he retains the Kantian injunction um, about the, uh, in other words, kind of, so, so the, um, the idea of absolute knowledge is a regulative ideal, mm -hmm. and there's no way of, you know, um, there's no way of actually kind of realizing the kind of the consummation of, uh, <coughs> the process of the rational understanding, or the exhaustive um, uh, intelligence of the real. Um, but I think, but and I think this is all, all, also someone who would defend the autonomy of the conceptual, and that kind of idealism is important and necessary. Yes, yes. Um, and, uh, but also, if you, you can be a realist about ideas, you can be a realist about phenomena. Um, so, so I'll also pick up, um, I mean, connecting to that line from race that you're quoting, and I think that it's, uh, it has to find, because uh, time has so much been identified with philosophy, with a form of interiority, you know, that's why, that would be the assumption that like, time sort of, a privileging of time would support uh, idealism, um, and I agree with Ray that like this opposition between idealism and realism should absolutely not be, Reified. What I'm trying to show, though, is that, like, internally to the problem of time, uh, is the structure of the trace that that spells out the logical necessity of a material support. So instead of again, I mean, I'm going to be a little repetitive now, but instead of an external critique of a supposed idealist account of time, what the logical account of the trace allows you to do is to take that on its own terms and show that it inscribes within itself the necessity of the trade structure and hence material support and hence like undermines the idea of a pure interiority or a pure auto affection but through the problem of auto affection itself for example now then when you have that structure as I was trying to point out today that also allows you to give an account of the synthesis of time that doesn't depend on the existence of life or consciousness and that's very important to speak to some of the concerns that Ray has because Ray mentioned Deleuze's notion of large subjectivity or, or psychic contraction. That's besides an idea that, like, whenever there is a synthesis of succession, whenever there's a recording of the passage of time, even in material structures, we need a type of some form of life or animation or consciousness to account for that contraction, hence that synthesis of time. Whereas the notion of organ materiality that I'm developing has the logical and conceptual resources to think the synthesis of succession without presupposing the advent of life or consciousness. And hence it's meta-theoretically compatible with the materialism without itself authorizing itself the way materialist philosophy would do. And also it thereby also has the capacity to engage the idealist accounts of temporality on their own terms. So, so. I mean I, I wonder actually I kind of have a question for you in relation to um, 
but all of time as well. And I know that you haven't given your paper yet this weekend, but uh, I suppose I wonder, you know, listening to Martin's paper um, with you here, I was thinking about the relation between his work on the trace structure and your work on the concept of plasticity, and which might also relate to this conversation about about Bergson and duration, or a sort of the problem of the discrete and the continuous. And I wonder um, if you might be willing to say a little bit about how you might think about uh, the relation of you know your thinking of plasticity uh, to the problem of time as it you know made the stage in either Martin's or Ray's papers. Um, well. Um when I was um, arguing a bit uh, against your interpretation of Bergson, I wasn't uh, actually I wasn't claiming this uh, Nietzschean yeah. move like affirmation. And if you don't agree with me, it means that you're reactive. This is not at all my. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but. It seems to me that, um, well, again, I'm not a Bergsonian, and, um, but what resists, according to me, in this notion of cre creativity is that in order to think, well, to elaborate the concept of time, we need a certain concept, or whatever, I don't know how to call that, of fashionability. In a way, what Bergson says is that time, in a certain sense, is our creation. And because you, you asked me about plasticity, mm -hmm. plasticity is a, a way of saying that fashioning is always prior to being, is even prior <coughs> to becoming. So, and in a certain sense, Heidegger acknowledges that also when, as you know, at the end of his life, he says, I was wrong. Time is not a structural, mm, well, I don't know, time is not this, uh, what, what I thought it was, I mean, this structure of the design. Time has to give way to this more originary instance, as you know, it is the move from being, being in time to time and being. Time has to be uh, derived, we have to think of time as being as derived from something more originary, which is the gift. And in a certain way, well, this is the way I understand that, because it is very difficult. In a certain way, this given, well, the myth of the given, the given, according to me, is not given, it is fashion. Even in Heidegger, and this is what I call plasticity that in fact there is no, and I agree with, with you on that, there's no givenness. I mean the givenness of the given is a kind of an artificiality, is a kind of plasticity. And, and this is why I'm defending Bergson, because I think that when he talks about creativity, it is not this Deleuzean thing, or it is, um, because uh, ontology is always secondary, or metaphysics is always derived from something like an originary uh, fashion sculpting, or whatever, forming. Right. But I wonder, um, I mean, Stephanie's paper took up uh, the problem of Galazenheit and Heidegger. I wonder, I mean, I wonder if you could say a little more about how you see that Heideggerian, the thinking of that you know, concept or problem, whatever we want to call it, in relation to plasticity or what you're calling fashioning. Um, how do you see the relation between something like the the gift or the lozenheit or the letting be in Heidegger and the, yeah. and the and plasticity or fashioning. Yes, yeah, because of course, uh, at first sight, it seems totally contradictory. Because if you have given this, if you have Galassenheim, if you have whatever gift given, or whatever, it, it seems totally opposed to creation, fashioning, uh, sculpting, artistic. But in fact, I discovered when reading Heidegger closely that when he talks about Heraclitus, for example, he says that the flux is, 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 he calls that the making of an image. Time has something to do with the image making. So I said, what is that? 
It is in the Nietzsche book. And image making, so I tried to, to, to understand what it was. And I found Heidegger in other passages. It is a metamorphosis. What Heraclitus is thinking, is elaborating, is um, that everything which is given to us, in a way, is um, a transformation, an originary transformation. So in that sense, given this, the immediacy of the, of the given, uh, the plenitude of uh, anything, of everything, is in fact the result of something which is permanently transforming itself. So that's why yeah, yeah. there's no way in opposing, for example, nature to art or the artifice. They're artificial too. But what about the living with the well, Adrian had a question as well. But okay, but just the direct follow-up. Yeah, go ahead. Direct follow-up, please. Just yeah. So, uh, but what about the relation between the living and the non-living? In your sense, is there plasticity when nothing is alive, or does plasticity only come on the scene once you have living organic beings? Like, so, um, so, so is the notion of plasticity dependent upon the notion of the living? What's the relation between the living and the plastic? Well, of course, immediately uh, plasticity is related to life. Uh, it would be difficult to talk, even if we could come back to crystal. You know, Hegel wrote a lot on crystal in the future. But anyway, uh, it would be difficult to say that a stone is plastic or that this table is plastic. But if we understand the inorganic as for it does in the building pleasure principle, as this death drive, the internal tendency of everything that is living to go back, to, to, to come back to this inorganic state. Yeah. Then plasticity means both fashioning, creation of life, and creation of the given, and also the return to the yeah. defashioning or the de But that's the that there is so life. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have that interplay once there is something living, but if it's the case, if we accept the Darwinian account that like, the non-living precedes the living, and there's only plasticity once there's the living, then plasticity doesn't come first. Because the question, I mean, just very briefly, the question would be, is plasticity, is plasticity then also a condition, a precondition for the possible emergence of plasticity? If plasticity is related to life, um, and it's a sort of uh, principle of indetermination or transformation, what is the principle of indetermination and transformation whereby plasticity comes into being in the first place. And so that sort of question, like, that for me is the, like, the sort of fundamental no, of the problem. That's the value of what you said about person, right? right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. But in a different, you know, register. Yeah. Uh, but it's a, uh, I mean, we don't have to maybe answer that question now, but it's just a, uh, perhaps uh, these things will come up in your talk tomorrow, but, um, you know, it, do we need plasticity to get plasticity in the first instance? And, if that were the case, doesn't it have to be something which really is like physically originary, um, and not that doesn't just come into being with with life? Um, but I don't know. If, well, originally, yeah. if I understand well, plasticity is a notion, well, it's a physical concept which designates as simply a property of certain materials. Right. It is not. Yeah. Well, of course, well, usually it is associated with life, of course, as I say. But originally, 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 uh, uh, the city is the property of certain materials, uh, which is different from elasticity, polymorphism, means that when a material receives a kind of shock, it cannot go back to its original form. Uh, this is what differentiates plasticity uh, from elasticity. And elastic comes back to its original shape. So in that sense, if we uh, live and action on, on this physical sense, in a way, the origin of plasticity is uh, a kind of uh, answer to or what response response to an originary shock. Plasticity comes, well, it is an 
uh, an originary response to a trauma of the, the trauma of the origin itself. So it is a kind of, to me, it is a kind of um, traumatic economy. How things in general are there because they are echoing the first blow. I think I think we should move to yeah, yeah, Adrian's follow up, and then I think actually that we'll um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that we'll have to uh, uh, let the question of um, methodology and epistemology rest for the moment, and hopefully it will be something that we can continue to take up once we open things up to the to the floor. Um, I think. Well, I just I just wanted to let Adrian follow up, and then and, and then yes, we'll move to questions. Sure, we yeah. can. Yeah, we can. Perhaps we'll emerge. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think that would be, yeah. that would be very important to yeah. Well, somewhat strangely, this is to follow up on you know, what got this portion of the discussion uh, rolling. Nathan's question about uh, the implication of Kathleen's work on plasticity for uh, what both Ray and Martin presented today. Uh, and this isn't to speak for Kathleen, but she and I uh, share in common a, a, a passion for engaging with the life sciences in particular. Uh, you know, this is, I, I think, what drew us together and led us to come up with the idea of writing a book together. Uh, and uh, taking the examples of neuroplasticity and epigenetics, talk about the latter uh, tomorrow. But uh, taking uh, some of that into account, I think, shed some interesting light on aspects of the positions that Martin and Ray uh, staked out uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, and perhaps I can begin by talking about what I see as important in terms of Kathleen's work vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ray, and specifically Ray's engagement with the sellers, uh, and then just a little something in terms of Martin's relationship to uh, Darwinian evolutionary theory, uh, and get the two of them to respond. Now, uh, I don't know if we'll really have time for a response, but I'd, I'd love to hear your answer. Okay. Um, now, of <laughs> course, there's not just the sellers of the 1956 essay, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind. The other sellers who seems most important for you is the one of uh, 1962's Philosophy and the Scientific Image of Man. Uh, and I was very pleased to hear you uh, 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 indicate that you are open and sympathetic to uh, a sense of a dialectical interpenetration between the manifest and scientific images. Uh, of course, with the Neurath boat uh, caveat that you can't just get rid of everything all at once. You have to replace certain things while leaving others uh, situated so you have something to stand on while doing so. Um, but uh, one of the things that struck me, though, is that uh, you reminded me in your uh, uh, exegesis of this part of Seller's Corpus uh, that he associates uh, the scientific image with a particulate vision that uh, you know you basically have what you already had in 17th and 18th century modern science, a la Newton, Boyle, etc. You know the idea of a, 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 a of, of mechanics of corpuscular bodies, matter and motion, and that that's fundamentally what the natural sciences uh, 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 picture when thinking about reality. And it seems to me that recent developments in the life sciences. Uh, and of course, as perhaps the region of, of the natural science is most relevant for talking about uh, images of man, which is part of what, of course, Sellers is concerned with, um, is that um, with notions of distributed cognition, uh, 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 you know, the plasticity of neural networks, etc., that the particulate vision itself is precisely part of what uh, is in question uh, in terms of uh, certain developments in, in the natural sciences generally and the life sciences especially. Um, and so it seems as though there would be the possibility that if we grant uh, that you know we have to take into account through something like neuroplasticity, how even if the manifest image involves certain things we might be tempted to deride as epiphenomenal, as just illusory folk psychological conceptions of what's involved in our cognition and comportment. Plasticity indicates that those things can't just be dismissed as epiphenomenal because the illusions have a way of describing themselves as real through their being set up at the level of what the sciences are telling us, a dialectic already between the manifest and uh, you know, material images of man. And if that's the case, it seems as though Seller's commitment to a particulate vision is part of what has to get thrown out if we really take seriously what is happening on the train of the sciences as directly relevant for talking about quote unquote images of man. Now, apropos Martin, um, one thing that I was that had in the back of my mind when asking you that very brief 
question uh, earlier today uh, after your talk. Uh, is what particular version of Darwinism uh, do you have in mind? Because, of course, uh, there are certain uh, developments uh, that are fueled, being fueled by research in epigenetics now, which involves, as Captain well knows, a resurgence of a certain uh, qualified attenuated version of neo-Lamarckism uh, that uh, really uh, could be seen as potentially revolutionary with respect to uh, what we associate with traditional Darwinism. And uh, this is related to uh, what I was asking in so far as I think that you need to have an account that has uh, stratified degrees of empirical sensitivity and insensitivity along the lines of a certain reading of Hegel's uh, Real Philosophy in the Encyclopedia, or even Quine's vision of the relation between the synthetic and the analytic after he's destabilized that opposition in two dogmas of empiricism. And given that, it would seem as though there might be a need to make certain concessions about the global meta-theoretical logical expressive framework uh, with respect to shifts in uh, post-Darwinian evolutionary theory that it doesn't seem thus far, uh, perhaps you've reckoned with in the way that, based on your own methodology, you are you know, obligated to, uh, you know, if indeed you're claiming to have this rest upon uh, you know, whatever the present's best empirical foundations offer at all. So I'm dying to answer that, of course. But we, we, we can return to it later. Like, yeah, we should open No, I think we can allow. I think we can allow a couple of responses. We, we have, Sorry for being long No, no, it's a very long question. Yeah, let's, let's have, we try to keep your responses brief to the point. And let's try to uh, minimize, you know, any back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's have two responses. <laughs> Okay, okay. So let's have two responses from Martin and Ray without any other support in between, and then we'll move to you. Yeah, you go first. Well, go to the particular nature of the kind of image. Two things. One is, um, you have to be careful about the word particulars need not be understood in terms of kind of uh, elementary particle or kind of, so in other words, it need, I think it would be hasty to identify uh, this characterization of the scientific image with a commitment to kind of, uh, you know, 18th century mechanical material. And because, you know, settlers right in the middle of the 20th century knew all about, you know, what had happened in the intervening 200 years. However, so I think he, what he means by particulates is, and again, it's very common, he, actually, it's related to what, he means something discontinuous. In other words, and, the opposition is between the particular and the non-particular is between you know, the discrete and the continuous. Now, the nature, whether the, the discrete are quanta of, of energy or whatever, you know, so, it, so, so in other words, the word particular should not be understood as a little bill billiard balls. Okay. Secondly, he explicitly, the, the passage I cited from at the end of Philosophy and the Scientific Image of Man is that uh, sellers envisages uh, the integration of um, you know of kind of uh, sensory processes into kind of physical theory, and he says that you know this is what he wants to happen. He, he's basically kind of holding out for it. Um, so in other words, and he actually Sellers is a metaphysician, and he one of the, it's one of the most kind of cryptic um, portions of the system. And he submits a metaphysics of processes. In, in other words, he, he endorses a kind of process metaphysics. But what he means now, how, but the point is that it's you, you want a scientific account of what pure processes are, and but by doing that, then you can kind of partially integrate one kind of fundamental aspect of the manifest image within the scientific image. So it's not. So again, this is a kind of an ongoing transaction, and it's not kind of. A, well, very quickly, since you've been reading secondary literature, do you, do you know if he had read the then recently published 1949 book by Donald Hebb, The Organization of Behavior, which is the origin of Hebb's law and neurons that uh, fire together, wire together? This is you know, one of the uber sources of the notion of plasticity. And I'm curious. But I think we can come back to this. I think we can come back to this discussion. I'm going to be I specified three, three things that were the most significant philosophical implications and publications of Darwinism, the following three. The living is essentially independent from the non-living. Animated intention is possible, impossible without mindless dead repetition, in, mindless inanimate repetition, and that life is an utterly contingent and destructible phenomenon. And these three implications seems to me, whatever modifications you have in evolutionary theory, 
except at the cost of abolishing the very concept of evolution, these implications are always going to be there. And, it's, and it's to have a meta-theoretical framework that is responsive to those three aspects that, that, that I'm construing what I'm doing. Uh, so, and that's also what I take data meaning cloud when he says that the trauma of Darwinism is what will have been resisted for the longest time in philosophy. Because there are so many philosophical commitments that have to deny either all three or one of these. And I'm trying to construct an account that is responsive to all three and that accounts for the synthesis of time by being responsive to those three. So in that way, I don't think I have to nervously check on every development and every trend theory to see it still lines up. Because it's like, this, these, all these three implications follow from the basic concept of evolution. And now, I, 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 I'm just uh, very clear that th those also seem like possible criteria yeah. of philosophical materialism. That is to say, mm -hmm. any philosophical materialism which is going to be materialist in a way which is responsible, you know, for like the content of science, you know, yeah. those are three preconditions for that's material. Yeah. I mean, I think it is impossible <laughs> to, yeah. to define materialism in the middle of that. Yeah. So yeah. let's let's turn it over to yeah. questions yeah. from anyone. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, so we have about that's 45 fun. minutes now, and we'll finish around. Uh, 9.15, which would be two hours. Um, so questions from anyone uh, that have, you know, occurred to you over the course of the day um, or that, you know, relate specifically to the issues that we're talking about. Very well. Okay. So there's a question from Martin again. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, I mean, we sort of moved on from this such a bit, but I'm indulging. Um, uh, Person again, because you know, this question. I, on the one hand, I'm pretty sympathetic to your your conception of this kind of um, kind of dynamic conception of presence, in which duration, in a certain sense, uh, is uh, is a capacity that, in a certain sense, doesn't have to have recourse to some kind of external support. I think it's very, very uh, sort of uh, whatever um, clear uh, concept. Now, the question I had here, first of all, is like the, the question of continuity. I mean, you know better than anyone that that. For the history of you know, the last 2,500 years, the concept of time has always been difficult, in part because it has to be formulated in terms of a kind of articulation of continuity and discontinuity, right? And in every theory of time, every philosophy of time, there's always some attempt to sort of produce a kind of articulation of those yes. two terms, those two uh, demands. And if the question of negativity drops out of Bergson's uh, conception of time and his philosophy in general, it doesn't mean that there isn't still an, an attempt to address the, those two uh, imperatives in thinking of the time. And so what he attempts to do is think of a, a certain kind of production of difference without negativity. And what that means, I think, has to be really taken seriously. And of course, in the you know the, the letter of his text itself, I mean, he has you know he, he formulates this this production of difference as a heterogeneity that's also continuous, which is very difficult to think. It's not so yeah. not so simple. Um, but the point, point, the important point, it seems to me, is that it's an attempt to think of this production difference without having recourse to the logical category of negation. And the only reason I ask this is because it seems to me that both in your paper earlier today, but also in some of your remarks, the sort of critique that you level at, at, at Burson is ultimately that he can't think the production of, or temporalization because he doesn't have uh, a kind of moment of negation in that process. And I don't know why you have recourse to the term negation. Um, because, I mean, certainly the notion of the trace, as you develop it, but also as it's been developed by, by others, um, is precisely an attempt to think of this, this process of, of temporalization, if you like, but also processes which are uh, more originary than, than temporalization, without having recourse to, to the, the logical category of deviation. And there's, and there's a reason why that's the case. And so, so I, I just, if you agree with me that you use the term negation at these kind of crucial moments in your critique of Bergson, I just sort of want to know what you mean by negation, because um, it seems like it seems like the wrong term to use. But okay, thank you. That allows me to to reiterate and specify a number of things. First of all, one very important move that I'm making in the way I'm reading the history of the philosophy of time is to say that the fundamental problem is not continuity and discontinuity; it's succession and synthesis, and that all the problems of continuity and discontinuity are more profoundly understood as a relation between succession and synthesis. And that's the irreducible problem. Actually, and Bergson knew this extremely well. In De la Nature du Temps, which is this like fantastic little essay on the concept of time, I mean, he precisely starts out, that's the problem, the relation between succession and synthesis. That is to say, you, you don't have time 
without a difference between before and after. Mm -hmm. But you also don't have time without a synthesis that relates before to after. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the classical way of solving this problem, first introduced by Augustine in the Confessions, is, is to say that, like, well, of course, the past is no longer, the future is not yet, the present ceases to be as soon as it comes to be. But the being of these categories comes from the memory of the past, the perception of the present, the anticipation of the future. Now, but that solution hinges on that the consciousness that remembers and anticipates and perceives itself is present in itself, and hence would have to be exempt from that same problem of time as immediately ceasing to be. Uh, now, the, uh, the most brilliant attempt to, to solve this and I was come to the transcendental apostate, and he says, like, well, it's just a formal unity I have to posit. I don't substantialize it at all. And I take up that solution at length in the first chapter of Radical Atheism. What's interesting with people like Bergson and Heidegger is that they can't avail themselves of a Kantian solution because they precisely want to say that nothing is exempt from time, even formally. So Heidegger's going to say in his comfort, for example, that no, the I think is already the auto affection of time. So that already raises the question of synthesis on this, what is supposed to synthesize. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm saying if you want to go there, if you want to think time as irreducible, then you're going to need the structure of the trace for the, for the reasons I specified. Uh, so, the reason why negativity is very central here is because that I'm trying to show that that is the problem of time. If the problem of time is the problem of succession. And the problem of succession is the fact that uh, it's not a succession from one now that is and then another now that comes to be, but that the now must cease to be in its very event. That's why time is nothing but negativity. And that's what Hegel says in the Yemen week, that's what he says in the philosophy of nature, and that's what Derrida shows. That's precisely it's the passageway to the thinking of the trace, the diagramma, is the immediate self-negation of the now. So that's why negativity is completely central to the account. And that's also then when I show in person why, um, why the heterogeneity, yet continuity, doesn't work. And I'm trying to show on his own terms, trying to take into account how he's trying to solve it. And think then, the heterogeneity here is supposed to be the absolute distinct, distinctness of S and S dash in the stuff that Ray was talking about. Now, if that's going to be a heterogeneity of difference in kind, then S would have to be completely discrete in relation to S dash. Uh, but Bertrand's going to say at the same time, there is no such discrete state, because every state immediately passes into another state. There's no difference between persisting in the same state and moving from one state to another person. So, so, so that's immediate passage away. That would actually negate the distinctness that would guarantee heterogeneity. And instead, you have a continuity that snowballs to include everything. But then you have also no heterogeneity. You actually have a complete homogeneity of just general move. You have pure continuity. So all of these effects, uh, effects of that, whether you're positing something discrete or something continuous, you're not thinking the problem of immediate self-negation, and that's the problem of time. And the only way to think that, I claim, is to think the communication of time and space you do in the structure of the trace. So, uh, but I'm trying to be responsive to the specific articulations. Uh, and that's why I take, uh, use Bergson against himself, this, this idea of he thinks he can have immediate passage without having immediate negation. But if you have that, you only have a spatial difference, you know, like I move from point A to point B in space. Point A still remains, you know. But if there's a temporal difference, what makes it temporal is that when I move from now A to now B, now A is no longer, you know. That's what makes it temporal in the first place. And that negation happens right away. So that's why uh, both verbs and fails to think time and why you can't think time without thinking negativity. And just tack on one more thing to that. That means because time is nothing but negativity, it has to be spatial to be anything at all. So unlike what Bergson says, that spatialization is a distortion of the nature of time. No, it's not accident we can only speak about time in spatial terms, because time posited for itself is nothing but negativity. It has to be spatialized to be anything at all. But then in turn, that spatiality is going to be beset by the same negativity of temporality. And it's that structure, that structure of the trace, allows it to fit. And then I'm trying to show how that has expressed its purchase on the way that the problem of time has been articulated throughout the history of philosophy. I want to maybe come back to, uh, to the, second, um, the second question that Nathan posed, as to the question of the priority of the, que uh, of, of, of the problem of time. And, and maybe just to, to sort of situate it, um, 
in relationship to to at least the, sort of the reading of Kant that, that I was trying to put forward, which was to identify a problem in Kant of what I was calling bare existence, which would be an externality that could not be internalized by thought. And I guess the question that I have, and I kind of want to put maybe, you know, uh, to see to see Martin and, and, and Ray maybe tackle this question in relationship to their own projects, um, is that it seems to me like the force of the of the of the problem of extinction, as you as you as you pose it, is precisely that it, it's something that is thought, but in order for it to be thought, it requires the negation of thought. In other words, that's precisely the force of this problem, which I think is actually bears some similarity to this issue in Kant that, that, that I see emerging of an existence that in itself can't be made interior to the process of thought. Now, it seems to me like there's a kind of impasse, and maybe I'm wrong, between the sort of the problem as deconstruction poses it, which is precisely going to always sort of work imminently, and the problem then, and, and it seemed to me, I mean, maybe I was wrong, it seemed like you were backing a little bit away from the necessity of positing this as something that's a question of the absolute, right? And so that one actually has then a point that can force in this rupture, which I think is already in, in, at the heart of the, the critical system, between the process of signification, that is the various means by which one would try to denote something that escapes meaning, and the existence as such of the meaningless. Right? It seems like, I, I mean, I think there's something at stake in holding those two problems apart. And um, I guess, the, I mean, if, if how I've reformulated this um, is clear, I mean, I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about that in relationship to this, this question that you posed, Ray, when I think you, and, and also, I think it's also, I mean, you, you mentioned this in your sort of critique of Mansu, but the reason why you don't want to admit the priority of the question of time in order to, to hold rigorously to this sort of the, in some sense, and the in itself of the existent, I mean, in, in the terms that I was quoted, but. Okay. Um, yes, I think I agree. I think you formulate uh, the, uh, the issue ex precisely and exactly. Um, Okay, two things. Like one, the, the, um, the problem of extinction is a problem about the structure of the manifest image. In other words, it's a kind of a it's it's a challenge to um, to the way in which philosophers it's, it's a challenge to philosophers and the way in which certain philosophers have kind of sought to adjudicate the relationship between the scientific and manifest images. No, but it's also about. Um, so, and it is about a problem about can you think about what it has an it has an interesting status because it's both like it's transcendental and empirical. It's something that it's not simply a kind of a postulated as a kind of it's not a nebulous alterity or exteriority. It's not an absolute transcendence. It's something. It's a determinate punctual event, but that in a way kind of uh, disorganizes or kind of uh, you know, warps. You know the kind of the uh, the parallelism of empirical and transcendental, as kind of uh, delineated by certainly by kind of th th classical kind of transcendental phenomenology and the variance of those of those projects. But it's also about negation. And it's also about the relationship between thought and negation, and, and this is tied to kind of the issue of time. And one of the things that I think, and this is something that Bergson, I think, is. This is a very real problem. Is that it's not you have to be very clear. It's not clear that negativity can be um, you know, simply kind of projected uh, outside the conceptual order. In other words, like negation and negativity. It seems to me you have to be very careful about ontologizing negativity. In other words, it's it's okay to kind of to suspend to articulate the relationship between being and non-being. Uh, insofar as thinking itself as a kind of non-being, but to simply you must you can't hypothesize negation or negativity, nor I think are there real contradictions, or at least I'm I'm kind of I'm very kind of uh, skeptical about the claim that there are kind of real contradictions in being. So it's, it's, for instance, in time, it's not clear 
Why is the past, it is simply, can you, can you identify, like when you say that the past is not now, is that a negation? Is the word, using the word not, not yet, not now, are there negations in physical reality? And it's, it's, it's I'm, so in other words, why I believe that kind of a dialecticity is, ought to govern the conceptual order. I think the problem is articulating the relationship between the dialectical, Dialectical negativity needs to identify um, a non-dialectical point that provides, that fuels its own kind of negative capacity. It's, in other words, to prevent the kind of the, the saturation of the conceptual order and to keep open a kind of a, you know, to keep open a, a, a hiatus that would, in, in other words, like contrary to kind of to sellers, I don't think it's possible to kind of the um, there's a limit to the convergence of the phenomenal and the noumenal, or the real and the ideal. And I think that thoughts, the challenge is that, is that there are two empirical reasons to kind of uh, why philosophy should factor in those constraints into its thinking. But they're constraints and they're not postulated as dogmatic limits. Is it right? So, in other words, I, want to, I think extinction is an enabling constraint for thought. But the point is to understand it. So the point is not to kind of um, to code it as some kind of uh, not to code it as some absolute alterity, and not to say that there's something that we are. Um, it's supposed to release conceptual capacity. Actually, it's not supposed to inhibit it. But precisely by showing how what enables thought is the disjunction between thinking and being. So uh, I'll also just pick up because I really want to take your question up in relation to what Ray was just saying now. And, and first of all, I just I realized I forgot to say this in relation to what Jason was saying. If you understand by the logical category of negation, the idea that there is something that is being negated, obviously what I'm saying doesn't appeal to the logical category of negation because it's, if you try to think negativity as logically originary, there's not something that is then being negated. Uh, so. In relation to what you were just saying, right? I mean, like um, uh, the negativity I'm talking about has to do with the, the, the immediate self-negation of the now as a logical requirement for thinking the movement of succession, mm -hmm. and then that gives way to the necessity of spatial inscription and thinking the codification of time and space and so on. And then you show how that's expressive of the way that time is recorded, whether phenomenologically in time consciousness or in material structure and so on. Uh, but that that concerns the logical thinking okay. of, of time. But that is curious to, that, to me that you could say that there is no negation in material reality since your idea of extinction is precisely that there is real extinction of the material world. So I was, I was curious that you would say that like, if, if, if maybe I misheard you, that, that, that you would you, that you were claiming that, that, that negation should just be understood as belonging, negativity should just belong to the conceptual order, when the whole thought of extinction as real is precisely that uh, material reality is being negated. No, it's not, because disintegration, and the disintegration of the fabric of space-time yeah. is not a negation. Okay, it's not a negation. Disintegration is not a negation. Cancel it even... At but it's a negativity. It's, it's, um, it's negativity for thought, but not in and of itself. Um, so in other words, it's kind of it has to be factored as an enabling negation for thinking, but extinction itself is neither kind of it's neither affirmative nor negative. But things cease to be in materiality. Things cease, yes, but materiality in you know whatever. Yeah. Look, the point and that's is, what I'm saying. If you yeah. think that things cease to be in materiality, yeah. the intelligibility of that claim hinders on you extending a minimal temporality. To that, to that, those material structures, because yeah. otherwise you couldn't think to see them to be. That's what I'm saying. Not the intelligibility of that claim okay. commits you to temporalizing that material reality you're talking about. Because otherwise yes. you can't have a logical yes. account of why it no. ceases to be. No, I agree. No, you're that, right. Yeah. I agree that there is a temporal, but I, I, there is obviously kind of um, a temporality implicated. Yeah. And so the question is, what is this? Because the disintegration of the fabric of space-time is that itself? It's again, it's a, it's a kind of a limitrophic 
point of you know where it's, it's also interesting as an empirical problem because how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of this event that isn't an event that kind of goes on like for kind of for longer than the entire history of the kind of the material universe? So so nothing will last much longer than something. Try to be yeah. Yeah. It is a very short question. Uh, a lowest common denominator between the two of you is that Martin has a distinction between the logical and the ontological, and you and Gray have a distinction between uh, the conceptual and the non-conceptual here. And I think that just to play the uh, the dialectical devil's advocate, uh, what I'm wondering is for each of you what your arguments are for why uh, the very distinction between the logical and the ontological or the conceptual and the non-conceptual uh, isn't immune to undoing itself or unraveling uh, at an intralogical, intraconceptual level. Because of course, you know, the Hegelian move would be to say that that very distinction that both of you are, are trading upon uh, ultimately cannot, it, it, you know, it, it, you know, to use Derrida language, deconstructs itself, which of course is very distinct to me. Uh, you know, it's not the dialectical, phenomenological approach to matters. So I'm wondering how two of you argue in favor of the idea of being able to maintain that strict distinction uh, 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 in a way that uh, is not vulnerable to those kinds of self-undermining movements that dialectics discerns in precisely those kinds of distinctions uh, when he turns his attention to them. Maybe we can hire responsibilities to some of what you mean. You want to do the more Perhaps, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I wonder specifically if there are some questions by anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask questions so far today. Well, we still have some time. Questions from anyone, of course, but... Uh, I have a question, but I'd like to hear the response. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you interested. Uh, yeah, very quickly. Um, <coughs> It's not a metaphysical distinction, and also, so like in other words, it's not an absolute kind of uh, distinction. And yes, all kind of uh, oppositions eventually unravel. Everything deconstructs itself, but not all at once. So things deconstruct themselves, but kind of you know. And so in other words, some oppositions should be kind of maintained, not absolutized, and not kind of ontologized, but simply kind of held because they do work and they do conceptual work. So that's. Yeah, I also that's something where I picked on the same lines. I tried to answer this relation to that noise earlier today. But again, the necessity for me to make a distinction between the logical and the logical is driven by the necessity of clarifying the status of what I'm saying and being able to justify those claims and be, be responsive to the relation between, say, a philosophical discourse and empirical science. Like, and all sorts of exigencies that I was trying to go through today. So in that way, the distinction, I'm not reifying it as an absolute distinction. I'm giving an account of why the type of philosophical arguments that I want to present need to present themselves as logical rather than ontological in order to be able to do the expressive work they want to do. Uh, and also, to give myself a harder time. Like, because this is, it is, doesn't have an ontological authority, it has all the depend on the expressive work we can do with regard to a certain text, a certain problem, a certain philosophical issue. I'm not coming with the authority of materialism or ontology. I'm coming and I'm doing work. Yeah, so this is, uh, that's how I would, uh, so I think that the uh, exigencies of my own reasoning demand a distinction to the reasons I'm trying to specify. That doesn't mean that I, that I absolutize the distinction. I mean, I, this is, this is less a particular driving question and more sort of hope that you guys will return to a moment that ended after, uh, in this afternoon, that sort of cut off around the question of disturbance between registers and between, you know, some kinds of this may be again the question between the logical and the ontological, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I was really interested in that question of, and this isn't to say ethics per se, but I guess the sort of utility in some sense, both kind of uh, philosophically, perhaps politically, perhaps historically. Of uh, yeah, of certain claims that attempt to make this passage back and forth, as you were saying, a kind of a troubling or disturbance. Which struck. I'm not a philosopher, at least I'm a lot of philosopher of science. I work more there sort of culture and history and politics. But I it was struck by the degree to which this is exactly the same question for historical materialism, right? In kind of a communist sense, exactly like understanding there are at times things that run sort of autonomous paths. For example, a certain line of philosophical inquiry that can run autonomously. And then there's two ways in which you can understand this. For example coinciding with or being disturbed by, let's say, political economy. Now, one of which would be one in which you say, 
actually, we understand now that these certain impasses in, let's say, philosophical thought are limited to, let's say, a certain structure of the value form that was dominant in this period, such that obviously to be an ontologist of some sort, you know, in the 14th century is vastly different than being one in the 21st, given simply shifts in structure of, let's say, you know, value and dominance, right? So that would be one. And the other one would be something, I guess, the status of, um, yeah, I'm curious about, you know, uh, let me detour it for a minute, around the question of extinction, you know? And I'm, I guess, and you know, I was from Lexi about this, so excuse, apologies to Lex, I butcher what we were saying about this, but in the same sense, what does it mean for something that, for new data, to, as you, you know, in, in your book, you, in my Helen Bound, you sort of push, it seems to me, a little harder on the way in which these are sort of, this is scientific, you could say, if not facts, then at least, as far, insofar as we know, these present certain challenges to thought. Not just spec, not purely speculatively. It's not saying, well, what if it was that extinction was going to happen? What if, he, what if he death were to come? It's rather sort of say, actually, no, it's going to, to a degree, as far as I understand it. So I guess, if that makes sense, I'm, I'm curious about two different interventions of, let's say, uh, you know, real shit in the world in the philosophical discourse. The first being periodization based on the conditions of those who philosophize, and the latter being, you say, insofar as we have a somewhat coherent captured material conditions that exist, to what degree does that impose themselves differently than, the, than like, you know, you were sort of, I think, raising in the question of, of the organization of this argument, why begin with these things? It seemed like you were sort of saying, like, well, is this just a figure? Is this a figure of thought to impel us? That's very different. The, the brutal fact of extinction, or the indifferent fact, hence its brutality, is different from the fact that I can, perhaps, I could write a story about the extinction of the universe. Or yeah, that's a very good question. Um, one of, a, a common or a fundamental objection is saying, well, you know, you, this, this is just, this is one theory about what will happen, but what if they're wrong? And I, I don't, and I think I want to insist, and again, like I kind of, I want to insist that the two, the empirical and the transcendental, or the kind of the, the conceptual and the kind of existential, are kind of, should both be operative. So in other words, this is something, um, nothing certain, um, but I wouldn't put money against it. In other words, so like I think, like people who want to claim it, so, so the claim that uh, you ought to be frightened. I think fear is a great philosophical precipitator. Um, and I think that it's important to be disturbed and, um, you know, or horrified, you know, by, by the world. And I think there's lots in contemporary reality to kind of, uh, to be kind of, uh, to be horrified about. Um, so, so the question, but the problem for me is like, I kind of, you know, obviously, I mean, the irony of, of kind of Heidegger's right that kind of anxiety is a kind of a motivating condition of philosophical question, but he calls it as a condition of you know the, the question is that like if you kind of confront you know anxiety in the face of your own kind of nothingness, your own kind of personal individual extinction, then the challenge is to kind of you know to be kind of resolute and authentic and against you can you can or you you personally can or or collectively a community can kind of uh, engage in a decision which will, you can rest some kind of subjective resol existential resolution. But the point is that what's interesting about extinction is that it robs you of the subjective resources. You can't adopt, it's not about whether or not you adopt an authentic or an inauthentic kind of attitude towards it, it's because it undoes the very possibility of kind of uh, you know, of, of some kind of resolute anticipation, etc., etc., and that's no. The problem is like if no one's worried about it, who worries about it? Most people, you know, who worries about what's going to happen? Like you know, a hundred, a thousand, a million years. So, so the, the, look, the, the question is this: is that at what stage, wh where do you gauge the limit between things that are imminent existential concerns and things which are just pure speculative possibilities? Also, like I think, philosophers are too quick to kind of. Uncertainty or saying it might not happen is a luxury of people who are not desperate. Okay, it's like there's lots of people in the world whose lives are one of continuous kind of existential. They live in a, in a state like the world is ending every single day for them, and they're just trying to kind of you know find a way. And there's, there's lots of people I think who live, you know, whose horizons of expectations are so minimal and so attenuated. And I think that 
is something that philosophy doesn't take enough consideration of. I mean, there's a great, there's a one good line about um, a philosopher who I, I, I do kind of respect and admire. Like Nick, he said, there's a line, he quoted a line of this is, I'm not having a point with Derrida, but I like Derrida. But he said that he quoted a line of Derrida from um, when Derrida is saying uh, the interrogation of the question of spirit must be the appropriate negotiation. He goes on with all these qualifications, and the line is, well, this is. This is, these are the words of a man who thinks he is going to live for a considerable amount of time. And the question is, what would we like to philosophize without the expectation that you're going to be alive for, or that we are going to be alive for a very long time? And I think that's interesting, you know, possibilities emerge if you start taking that question seriously. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you brought us back to, to this question, actually. And um, first of all, I, I want to say I wasn't... I'm saying this because it ties into this discussion. I wasn't entirely satisfied with what I was saying to Adrian. I, I do want to say, I think that like, if you're careful, you can distinguish between the logical and the ontological, you know, in, in very important ways. And, and, the, and the fact that everything needs to deconstruct itself should not be an excuse, and I don't think that is what Adrian means, but it should not be an excuse to, to not be conceptually rigorous uh, and, and make the distinctions that are needed um, to, to once again uh, quote Henry Sutton. He had this great line when he said that, like, Deconstruction thinks the pure form of essential impurity. So the thought of contamination is not an excuse to blend everything together. It demands the most rigorous conceptual articulation. Um, now, uh, the question that you that you recall, and I was trying to raise uh, to Ray at the end, which speaks to the methodol methodology question. It's my concern with the way. I saw you hinging many of your claims in Neil Bound on a type of scientific realism has to do with the fact that like if if you make your the, the critique of all the positions you, you, you take on like depend on that sort of fact of extinction that is going to happen, then <laughs> and I think Knox Speak already pointed this out in his review of that. Like I mean that's like if that was to be undone then like, the whole authority and philosophical account is made to rest on that, even though you have great arguments against vitalism that don't depend on that. And I think that's the difference between the sort of account that I'm trying to give internally, showing that these, these positions are untenable on their own terms, and you can show how death in the sense of becoming inorganic or dependency on the lifeless and so on is internal to what they are trying to defend. So you already undercut the position without having to project this extinction of the universe, you know, not, uh, uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing, I was very struck by how you're talking about it now, when you seem to want to rehabilitate the pathos of the way in which individuals live under the threat of death and so on, which I think, I do think is important, but that seems like a very different move than what you're saying in Neil Bound, that like, we shouldn't be extinction there. You don't seem to pay much attention, back in my credit, to the anxiety in front of extinction in the contrary, that anxiety is sort of patronized as like an inability to embrace the will to know as the will to nothingness. So what you were saying now about wanting to recognize the pathos of those mortals who seek to play for time in the face of in the face of extinction, that that that, that seems to me a little different than um, uh, because because that, that was another question I had about about the book that the fact that that everything is going to be extinguished doesn't make it meaningless unless you have a metaphysical conception of meaning where meaning depends on the indestructible. So I don't see how the thought of extinction leads to nihilism. Because I would say on the contrary, why something is meaningful and valuable is precisely because it can be lost, because it can be destroyed, and so on. Uh, so now, I mean, those are a number of questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, look, it's fundamentally, um, I describe it also as a trauma for, it's like the points Extinction is a trauma for phenomenology because it can't be phenomenologized. It, okay, kind of it defeats the resources of kind of phenomenal, phenomenal logical integration. Interpretation is a meaningful occurrence. It undoes the resources of kind of the resources of phenomenological sense. But this is not; these are not the only resources of sense. So it's a crisis in uh, the resources of sense making. It's a crisis in what it means for something to mean something. So it's a conceptual crisis. It's a crisis at the level, uh, at the normative level. Um, it means that it's, it's so it's supposed to, it's, it's deployed as, a, as, a, as an attack on modes of philosophy that think that are very, that I think are overly confident 
about um, they think that a kind of uh, that the human way of sense making or that the human being in the world or the human life world or, or human history is somehow kind of a, a sufficient sufficient unto itself and uh, provides it is kind of what I'm pointing out is, that, is that the inadequacy between the ways in which we understand ourselves as a species and what is gradually being revealed about our real state, state in the kind of in the universe. Now, so obviously one criticism is saying there's a, there's, a, there's a really kind of facile rejoinder to this. It's like, obviously the universe doesn't care about us, but I don't care that it doesn't care. So like, I'll just carry on. Yes, that's a very kind of good, but that's also a kind of, I think, a, a facile rejoinder. The point is not about... Um, because if the question is trying to understand, really to understand kind of what it means to be a thinking being, um, it means that we have to negotiate our relationship both to our past and our future. And in, uh, the claim that the future is this inexhaustible resource, mm -hmm. keep investing in the future because no matter how bad things are, things will get better. What if you knew that things were never going to get any better, things were just going to keep getting worse? Okay? What, would, what consequences would follow from that? I think they're quite interesting consequences. So, but, but the claim that you must, or you can somehow kind of uh, keep going. So in other words, so the, the claim is this. The claim is that thinking has interests that, that, that don't, don't coincide with living. Why? Because the, the articulation, the temporal structure uh, that articulates the ends of thought is not the same as that which governs the ends of life. So in other words, the temporality of thinking should not be um, simply kind of read off the temporality of living. And I think this is where I disagree with you, because you, I think, think that, so this claim that yes, because things won't exist, they're valuable now, but what does that actually mean? What well, it means, it means, it means, it's precisely because the universe doesn't care, it's precisely because I and everything I care about will be extinguished that I have to care about it. You know, it, 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 it can also lead me to hate it, to resent it, to not care about it, to want to destroy it. It's the condition of possibility. As the condition of care, it's the condition for both a positive and, an af and a negative affective response. I'm not saying that like, oh, this realization of finitude makes me like more responsive or caring. No, I'm saying it's the condition of possibility for any care at all. And as a, as a living affective being, whatever I am, I cannot be indifferent. You know, and so care is a structure condition that sense, but it can just as well lead me to hate the world, to want to destroy things as caring about them. But uh, since that very destructibility is that is, is is what precipitates care, the fall of that destructibility cannot lead to nihilism in the sense of meaninglessness. It, it, it's both what leads to hope and despair and so on. And it seems to me when you want to when you want to say that the fact of destruction or extinction makes things meaningless. That only is operative if one has a conception of meaning that is predicated on like for something to be meaningful, it has to be eternal and indestructible. No. But, 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 but it's important for my account that I'm not saying that like care is not a positive term. It might, it, it, it's it's, it's an it's a undecidable term between the positive and negative. It's what it was the condition of possibility for both negative and positive affective responses. But I would neither have a negative nor a positive affective response unless I thought that things were negatable, destructible, and so on. So, okay, so, no, yeah. I, so I accept that part of your account. And also yeah. what I want to say is that... And that is the account. Yeah. Senses are because, you know, uh, this is something I didn't, you know, this is something yeah. I hope, that yeah. I want to emphasize much more, is that, that it's, it's a, you know, the, the, the distinction between meaning and meaninglessness is not absolute. So that yeah. It's that what challenges or exhausts, you know, a certain kind of register of sensefulness or of sense making. It's not, it means that we have to find a new kind of way. It, it's, it's, it's a spur to change the way we understand it, to change the way we think about, well, I would hope like everything. Like, I, I mean, I, the claim is to make it radical enough so it precipitates some kind of radical kind of reinterrogation. Um, so, so yes, this is why like, I think the, the claim is that, um, because thinking can renegotiate is not tied to one fixed register of intelligibility. And also the key distinction is between intelligibility and meaning. The resources of intelligibility exceed and encompass the resources of meaning. Meaninglessness can be intelligible because there are more things to understand 
that makes sense for you in terms of your limits of So I think we have one last question, I believe, for Catherine uh, Stephanie. Yes. And then we'll and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. So I um I just wanted to ask, and this changes the subject completely, but yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, the depiction that you were kind of giving of these later Heideggerian categories, like you're just saying black men or whatever. Um, wait, as I understand these these concepts, I, I think that they're ones that Heidegger develops specifically as sort of like what Rene Schumann would call perspective categories that point beyond uh, the, the the moment of the turning of the, the closure, and that, that precisely Heidegger thinks even he himself can barely think, and that you know they don't exist. They're, I mean, they, they don't describe. The, this moment at all. They don't, they have not happened, you know. Um, and, and so they're precisely uh, developed in contrast to the, to the technological epoch. Yeah, as you it. Um, but the way you were describing them was in terms that are sort of um, most often used by Heidegger to describe the, the, the technological epoch. So I was wondering, how can you do that? How can you? Can you describe those those later concepts in those terms, or what the stakes are in doing that? So, what concepts is that? Fashion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fashion. Thanks. Yeah. No, the later concepts in Heidegger. Well, you were talking about when he. Yeah, that's in Heidegger. Yeah, only. And the gift. Yeah, the gift. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that yeah. was something about certain types of things. Well, well, the gift is It's about, well, I don't know if we have time to... to <laughs> we can have yeah, maybe five yeah. So minutes. very, very briefly. Um, I, well, I have a, an old, but a very ancient question in mind. It, well, as soon as I started to study philosophy, it was the status of essence. I understood what being was. Well, and it was existence. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> yeah, but, for a while. <laughs> essence. You know, and it's also a problem in Hegel's logic. You have being and then you have essence. What is an essence? And it's true that in Heidegger, in fact, the very um, uh, enigmatic concept in ontology is essence. And when I tried to understand what it was, um, and particularly in relation to the Gestalt, to technology. I discovered, I, I tried to uh, collect every definition I could find of essence in Heidegger, and I found that precisely essence was this transform, transformable uh, instance in ontology, in metaphysics, as well as, uh, as what comes after metaphysics. And that precisely in Heidegger, calls essence, the fashionability, the priority of fashionability over being. Yeah. Hmm. The, the, the definition comes in, appears in the Nietzsche book. And he says that Nietzsche teaches us that essence is in itself changeable. And of course, usually we don't think of essence as something transformable. On the contrary, we think of that essence as something permanent. And Plato, in Heidegger, on the contrary, develops this idea. What an essence is, is the transformable part of being. And in that sense, and as you know, not better than I, technology is on development. Technology is made of it, well, belongs to metaphysics in a way, in a certain sense. And at the same time, what Gelas and Heidegger is, uh, is revealed by technology because technology, as a kind of fashioning, reveals uh, the fashionability of essence, the fashionability of, of ontology. So this is very difficult. We should need. We, we would need. We might come back to it, or we yeah. can come back to it. But this is what I would say, just as briefly as I can. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. So again, uh, our sessions tomorrow begin at one p.m.